Nat Turner, historical figure, is someone that I didn't learn about until later in my life. Um, I grew up in Virginia, ironically 40 miles east of where Nat Turner's rebellion happened. I grew up in a time where um, we didn't have a lot of heroes, you know. Um, I come from well below the poverty line, so, you know, when you ask people, you know, about who they look up to, for, for us it was always athletes. And so when I learned about this in college, um, it was something that I gravitated toward. I felt like even before I was, became a filmmaker that this was something that I wanted to acclaim and then apply to my life. You know, when people ask me who I wanted to be like, I'd say Nat Turner. You know, at some point you have to stand up and say, I'm gonna do what I wanna do, regardless of um, what the odds are. And so about two years ago, I stepped away from acting and said the next film I'm involved with will be The Birth of a Nation and I'll be playing Nat Turner. For the next year and a half, I just raised money and uh, traveled all across the country begging. And uh, as one director, a friend of mine calls it, kissed a lot of frogs and uh, met a few princes. Hello, my name is Nate Parker, and I am the director of the film The Birth of a Nation, which is premiering in the U.S. Dramatic Competition at the 2016 Sundance Film Festival. D.W. Griffith, basically regarded as one of the uh, most prolific and um, innovative filmmakers of all time, in 1915 created a film that was the most racist uh, film, not only of its time, but t to date outside of Goebbels' um, films against the Poles in, in, in World War II. This film would have you believe, the original 1915, would have you, have you believe that the birth of a nation, the true birth of this nation, the, sus the sustenance that this, that kept this nation going was based on its justified fear of people of African descent. When this film made it to uh, the theaters, KKK's enrollment, you know, rose to over four million. At the end of such screenings, uh, they would take to the streets and they would lynch um, the black people that they saw. I kind of sold this project to investors and cast on legacy. I honestly believe this is a film that can start a conversation that can promote healing and systemic change in our country. There's so many things that are happening right now in 2015, uh, 100 years after the original Birth of a Nation film. Um, here we are. Uh, I'd say that is what I hope sets my film apart, is that it's relevant now that people will talk about this film with the specific intention of change. The thing that's tricky about this film is that my main subject is a person who lied for a living. And so most of the historical record, the archival record, was stuff that he had produced himself. So yeah, it's a little bit tricky to figure out what the truth was about his life because he was the primary source for information about his life. And part of what he did so well was construct his own story. I'm Penny Lane, director of Nuts, which is premiering in the US documentary competition at the 2016 Sundance Film Festival. Nuts is the mostly true story of a doctor named John Romulus Brinkley, who in 1917 claimed that he had cured impotence with goat testicle transplants. When I found Brinkley's story, I thought it was ready-made for a film. His biography is a tragedy. It's the classic American story of someone who's born with nothing and, you know, through his own hard work and genius, works his way to the top and then falls in this very spectacular way. One of the fun things about the film and how it ended up coming together is that it's structured as chapters, and each chapter is illustrated and animated by a different artist or team of artists. It's too bad I don't have Billy Goat Nuts. <laughs> too bad. Say, Doc, why don't you just put some in me? Beg your pardon? It also allowed me and us to kind of play with the idea of what's true because you're literally having the same scenes redrawn by different people and they're able to kind of enhance certain aspects of it or sort of see it from a different angle. Having the hand-drawn animations allowed us to think about what we could say was true about a given scene. 
or examine like different truths that could be coinciding with certain scenes. I thought from the very beginning that the last thing I wanted to do was make a film where you as the audience member could sit back and be like, what a bunch of dummies, how could they possibly have believed this? It was really important to me that it become clear that we're all those dummies. Like any of us can fall for anything. Brinkley was a person who knew that. And a pretty good rule of thumb would be the better the story is, the more critical distance you should bring to it. It's good to be skeptical of really great stories. The genesis of the idea for the movie came from first just being fascinated by that look that Barack and Michelle give each other. Just kind of feeling the authenticity in their love. And when I read about their first date, it had the makings of a movie because Michelle was not interested in him at first, but she gave him a chance to prove himself. I didn't fully lock into the idea and know how to approach it myself until I fell in love for the first time. And, and it was at that point that I realized that the, the movie wasn't just about falling in love, it was also about finding that person who makes you better. I'm Richard Tanney, director of Southside With You, which is premiering in the U.S. Dramatic Competition at the 2016 Sundance Film Festival. Southside With You chronicles the first date between Barack and Michelle Obama back in 1989 um, through the south side of Chicago. I think that setting the story over the course of a single day actually helped me hone in on who the characters were because I was able to um, uh, continuously follow them moment to moment as opposed to having to consider who they were over the course of years or decades. It was a, a very narrowly focused biopic. And of course I had done all of my homework about what had happened to them in their lives up until that moment in time. So that informed everything that, that happened over the course of the day. We set out to tell a love story and we set out to capture this one moment in time. There's a little bit of dramatic irony in the sense that we know what's gonna to happen to them, but the two characters don't. If anything, what I would want people to take away from the experience is that it just reminds them of how they felt when they were in that situation, or if they haven't fallen in love yet, that it, it gives them something to look forward to and strive for. I've been trying to think about a way to make a story or tell a story, the story of Christine Chubbuck for a really long time. I couldn't shake it for years, sort of the story and the thing and the fact that she wrote her own newscast of her own suicide, which just, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't wrap my head around what that all meant. And so with my last film, Actress, which is, which is a documentary about an actor, uh, I've been really thinking about performance and nonfiction and sort of how the fictional aspects of what performance bring out uh, interact with sort of the traditional idea of just watching something as it happens. And that gave me an end to think about how to do the film. It was a light bulb that just sort of went off. And I've been obsessed about this story for so long that I was just like, oh, that's how we, that's how we do it. You know, we, we make a film essentially about a film that maybe doesn't even need to exist. I'm Robert Green. I'm the director of Kate Plays Christine, which is playing in the U.S. documentary competition at the 2016 Sundance Film Festival. The film's called Kate Plays Christine. Um, it's about Caitlin Scheel, who is an actor who's been asked to play the role of Christine Chubbuck. Christine Chubbuck was a woman who um, committed suicide live on air in 1974 in Sarasota, Florida. It's trying to understand what happened, why, and what sort of the mystery is sort of surrounding it through uh, observing Kate, who's trying to play the role of, of Christine. So it's a documentary about an actor trying to understand a role. I think there's probably some ambiguous, strange link between performing and psychosis in a way. And, and maybe my actor friends would not want me to put it that way. But there's a, a, a need to put yourself out there, which for someone like Kate, Kate's a very shy person. And I remember being shocked, for example, when she told me she wanted to be an actor, because I was like, that's. Not, not the person I know, like, you're gonna put yourself out there that way. 
Um, and for her, it was, it's empowering to do that. Um, for this film particularly, I think it's, it's, the real question is, should, should you tell this kind of story? I don't, and I don't know if you should or not. I know that we encountered a lot of problems uh, internally with how we felt about the story as we learned more. And I won't really wanted that to be on screen. It's really about this idea that, you know, if you can't be seen in your, I think Kate says it best in the film, if you can't be seen in your real life, you find ways to be seen in, in some ways. My name is Sarah Giordino. I'm the director of Kiki, which is premiering in the U.S. documentary competition at the 2016 Sundance Film Festival. Kiki is a coming-of-age film about a group of LGBTQ youth in uh, uh, New York City. The Kiki scene is part of a subculture that started in uh, Harlem for you know over 100 years ago called Ballroom, and it centers around the, you know, this performative expression that happens at competitions called balls. And the most famous um, category that people compete in during this, these balls are performance or what we know as voguing, um, which is this amazing dance form. And um, what is so outstanding is that um, Twiggy, Chi Chi, Gia and other individuals that you'll meet in the film, they're leaders in the scene and they have created a grassroots political movement, youth-led movement, 
within this um, subculture tradition of ballroom. So it's not only about expressing yourselves in these um, fantastic events called balls, it's also about empowering yourself and gaining real political power. When they found out that I was a filmmaker, they sat me down and asked me, do you want to make a project about us? It was just this incredibly, you know, this, this gift to me as a filmmaker and as a person to be able to enter into this very protected private sphere that is the Kiki scene. And of course, I was an outsider. I didn't know about the culture. They had to explain it to me. And um, very early on, we decided that the only way that I could do this project would be if Twiggy came on as a co-writer of the project and that we collaborated very closely with the Kiki scene itself. And I think because we did that, that is why um, the film has such an intimate tone. The film will resonate with a wide range of audiences because I think we can all identify with growing up and coming into yourself. We can all understand the meaning of family and friendship but I also think that it's very important, even if you're not a person of trans experience or if you're not LGBTQ, these people are gaining basic human rights. And that is something we all need to listen to. And that is why this film is so important. My film Tallulah is about sort of rootless, van-dwelling young woman played by Ellen Page who, after a chance encounter in a hotel, um, impulsively kidnaps a toddler from what she believes is a negligent mother and takes the baby to the home of her ex-boyfriend's mother and passes the child off as her own in order to gain entry into this woman's life. Who are you? Are you Mrs. Money? How did you get up here? Uh, my friend Anikos. What happened? Is he hurt? Nothing. No, no, he's fine. I, last that I saw him, I, I just, I really need to find him. Well, I can't help you. I haven't seen my son in two years. He took all my money, okay? Of course he did. And when you see him, tell him to call his mother. No, wait, please, please, please. I just, I really need to find him. Look, I don't know who you are. I have no reason to believe you know my son. Come on, man. I have his fucking name tattooed on my hand. And so the film is really about how this impulsive crime radically alters and transforms the lives of these very different um, women. So what, you're looking for money? You're not gonna get it. What about like five bucks? Oh my God. Hi, I'm Sean Hader, and I'm the director of Tallulah, which is premiering in the US Dramatic Competition at the 2016 Sundance Film Festival. The original germ of the film came from my time working as a nanny for all of the four-star hotels when I first moved to LA, and I had a lot of really strange encounters with really strange parents, specifically mothers. I think it just raised the question for me of why some women have children and whether all women have it in them to be mothers or whether that's something that people do for the wrong reasons. But then the movie ultimately became about something much bigger for me, which was really more about disconnected people searching for connection. I think all of these actresses were able to capture what I'm interested in about human behavior, which is good people making really bad choices. There's a line in the film, we're all horrible and we're all just people. And I think that really has ended up emerging as really something that I'm interested in as a writer and a filmmaker and the movie has ended up being about that and I love that. I think if it's something that I could write and articulate very well, then I would be a writer, you know, a novelist or, or something. But um, I can't, I can't seem to write it down with words, so I try to do that with film and images and, and sound and interaction between people. You know, that to me is like the soul of a film or any story.
I'm Soyoung Kim, writer-director of Love Song, which is premiering in the U.S. dramatic competition at the 2016 Sundance Film Festival. Riley Q plays Sarah, who's a young mother, and she's struggling in her marriage because her husband travels a lot for his work, and she's kind of stranded alone in the countryside in this home. So she feels slightly abandoned and very lonely. I think that's when her best friend comes to visit her, and it's like it opens up an opportunity, I think, emotionally for her to kind of look for that joyfulness that you could find, you know, in love. I think Love Song is really different than my other films because my past films have been tightly scripted. And then also within the script, I allow the actors to improvise and take the you know topic of their conversation to any extreme that they wanted to, particularly about sex and their past sexual experiences and stuff. They were really playful and super dynamic. Their chemistry was fantastic on set. And because it was intimate, I think they felt like they could completely like explore. I think mostly I make films so that I could communicate that inexplicable feeling or emotions that people have with each other, you know, no matter if it's mother-daughter relationship or husband and wife or two friends. This like chemistry between people that you could capture on camera. I started making movies when I was like 13. And right after film school, I was very lost and I wasn't sure how to start my career. It was 1985. During that period, my sister introduced me to her friends of hers who were meditators and they had a teacher. And I started to travel and live with the teacher who was like a guru. Uh, I ended up living with him for 18 years, traveling with him for 18 years. And devoting, we all devoted our life to this, to meditation and this whole concept of helping the planet raise its energy and just meditate and just just take care of ourselves and be good clean people but it it turned into a very controlling situation and none of us saw it happen like we all got there kind of educated you know and smart sort of obviously a little enough <laughs> I'm not that smart I'm Will Allen director of Holy Hell which is premiering in the US documentary competition at the 2016 Sundance Film Festival when the, when the whole thing ended and I, and I come out of it, I, I left, I got away with my films. That's all I took. I didn't even take all of them. I just took some and I have hundreds of hours of films that I made during that period for the group. Even though we were all so close, we never spoke to each other about these things. The teacher kept everything very quiet. No one knew what was going on. So when the group broke up and I ended up, you know, the shard goes over here and I want to get out and free and everyone goes in different directions, no one was talking. And so years go by and I didn't really even know what happened exactly. It was so confusing. And so I started to talk to friends to try to find out what was going on and what happened to them. And that's when I found out everything else. And that's when I wanted to tell the story. It just made sense to me to finish, to, to do it as closure for myself. Because I think during this period, I was in this community. I filmed everything and just showed the good stuff. Now that we're aware of the whole story, we're able to talk about the complexities of all of it and the dark and the holy and the hell. It's like you can't, they both go together. I felt like I would be able to capture something that started so innocent with just a handful of people and ends up so harmful, you know, with one leader who's abusing his power and nobody is aware of it.
Good morning. Uh, my name is Kim Yutani, and I'm a senior programmer here with the Sundance Film Festival. Welcome to the Sundance Film Festival, and welcome to today's Cinema Cafe. You can applaud. <laughs> Cinema Cafe is our conversations, our informal conversations with uh, festival guests, and we are really excited today to have two great actors who have great accents, um, who are in films here at Sundance this year. Um, we have Melanie Linsky, who is in the film Interve The Intervention. <laughs> and also Imogen Putz, who is in two films this year, uh, Frank and Lola and Green Room. So I want to thank them for taking time out of their Sundance schedules to be here. Um, also, I just want to plug uh, two more cinema cafes we have coming up. Tomorrow is uh, our, our cinema cafe with two legendary doc filmmakers, uh, D.A. Pennebaker and Chris Hedges. And then on Saturday, we have a, a conversation centered around Animal Animalisa. Um, with Duke Johnson and Charlie Kaufman, so you don't want to miss that one. Um, and finally, I want to introduce our moderator today. Um, she is a staff writer for the Los Angeles Times. Please welcome Amy Kaufman. Hi, everyone. Thank you guys for joining us. Feels like we're at the tail end of the festival. How long have you been in town? Um, I got here on Saturday. Nice. Yeah, it sort of feels like a long time. <laughs> I think I've been here about two days, but I got to see one film. Have you seen, did you get to see the films yet? I saw two. Oh, well, there you go. proud That's of myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Melanie, I saw you at a film last night, 11.30. She's a hardcore film fan. Yeah. <laughs> well, we've been so busy and we haven't been able to get tickets because it's been so booked up and everything. So finally we had a little break and we were like, we just went to the box office and we're like, what can we see, what can we see? Nice. Yeah. Is it, hard? it must be hard to fit in films between all of the promotion you're doing and everything, yeah? Yeah, Yeah, but also, I just want to walk around. Like, I don't know how many people here, like, live in Park City <laughs> or are just here, but walking around is amazing. Um, but I realised yesterday I was walking sort of in the middle of a road that I thought was a trail, so then <laughs> sort of imminent death was on the horizon. So, But, I, yeah, that's, that's the experience. So have you two ever met one another before this morning? No. We met, well, well oh, one time yes. I came up to you in the bathroom. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> um, Lucky me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. At the Napa Valley Film Festival, which is a film festival I highly recommend, because they just give you wine the entire yes. time. <laughs> Everywhere you go, they're like, here's a wine tasting, and then you sort of like, you know, you're doing Q&As, like, I had a great time in the movie. <laughs> um, we just bonded over Marmite. Oh, yeah, we did in, back in the green room. It's amazing. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, Melanie brought it all the way from New Zealand. That's where you're from, yes? Yes, I'm from New Zealand. There yes. you go. And Imogen, where are you from? I'm from London, a place called Chiswick. That's Ooh. where I'm from. No, I don't know if any of you guys have seen their films yet. Hopefully you have, but... <laughs> Both of you do a strong American accent. Like, I would have no clue that you were not from here. Has that something you've perfected over the years, or has it been a challenge? I think, um, hopefully, you just get better and better at it. And uh, we both live in America. Um, and so I think when you're constantly around it, your ear um, is certainly more inclined to, to pick up um, certain dialects and vowels and stuff like that. Um, but I think accents are just such incredible tools and endlessly fascinating and um, it's sort of the same as uh, you know costume or um, physical movement I mean it's just such an essential uh, kind of core for any any character yeah I love doing accents it's always weird because sometimes people get used to talking to me and then they're like oh maybe you should just do it as yourself because they suddenly get nervous and I don't I don't like doing things that are written for an American with my own accent. It just sounds kind of off. And also, I, people are always like, oh, I couldn't do your accent, but, uh, you know, growing up in New Zealand, we have so much American television and movies and stuff like that, so it's a very familiar sound. 
Did, did either of you um, dream or intend of working, uh, um, working in Hollywood or uh, in American theater or film before you ended up doing it, or did it just kind of happen that way? I wonder. It's, it's always funny, because in hindsight, you look back, don't you, and you kind of try and assemble in your brain when there was a specific moment that you were like, oh, I, wa I wanted to do this, because you hear about people who are three years old in their diapers being like, I'm going to be an actor. But that never um, happened. It just sort of was a slow, kind of organic process. But I think, I mean, I, I live in New York City, and you're spoilt with the theatre there. Um, and really... That, for me, in recent years, in the last kind of five years or so, has been astounding just how much you grew up in a certain type of theatre and then you come to America and you uh, kind of acquaint yourselves with, uh, like the, you know, Sam Shepard plays and this great playwright called Annie Baker, who's extraordinary. But you start to learn more and more about, about that sort of culture um, with, with theatre and um, that I, I would love to do more theatre. Yeah, I don't know what I'm talking about. Mm. Um, I, well, I was one of those dorks who was like, I want to be an actor, but um, I'm from a small town in New Zealand and everybody told me that's not a realistic job choice. So depending on what show, I, you know, I was watching like LA Law and then I was like, well, I could be a lawyer, but I just wanted to be like a TV lawyer. <laughs> um, so I kept trying to come up with different jobs that I could potentially do, but it was all I ever wanted to do. And then... I was trying to have a backup plan, I just couldn't. I was in my second to last year of high school and it was the year where you're supposed to you know, choose what you want to do at university and I was like, I want to go to film school. And then I ended up doing a movie in high school and I don't think I thought, I mean, I knew I wanted to do plays, I wanted to do whatever I could, but I didn't think I'm gonna go to Hollywood. I was like a chubby, you know, plain girl from New Zealand, so that wasn't really, and I didn't think it was like in the cards for me, but it just kind of happened that way. I got an agent and I started working here and I was like, okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, having to move away from home to pursue your career is probably like a big decision. Was it hard when you first uh, entered the industry here? Did you feel like I'm a long way from home? Absolutely. Um, and it's, it's an extraordinary part of this job though. It really is. And, not only do you get to travel to metropolitan cities, but uh, personally, I, I mean, I, I had a terrific time in Albuquerque. I was just astounded by the American landscape, and, and especially if you've read a lot of American literature or anything like that, that romanticism is still there. Like, you can find it. And so that's something that um, I just fell in love with, with the travel that came along with it. But certainly it's hard being away from um, family and stuff, but this job also has incredible things about it. Yeah, that's so funny. That's one of my favorite things too, going to small towns and getting to live there for a while. Yeah. I did a movie in a place called St. Mary's in Georgia, this little tiny town, and I rode a bicycle to work and I was so happy. <laughs> just every day, you know, going to the store and just, oh, I was like, oh, I live here in St. Mary's, Georgia. <laughs> um, <laughs> But yeah, the travel is such a great thing. But it's very lonely, you know, coming to... The first time I came to Los Angeles, I didn't understand how it worked. And it's so isolating being in Los Angeles if you don't know people. And auditions were so scary to me. I didn't know you had to put makeup on, for one thing. My agent was like, you probably should, you know, buy some mascara. <laughs> I just was so out of my element and... It, it was it was terrifying for a while until I found like a group of friends who felt like my family. It was a scary place. Do you recall your first time coming to Sundance? Yes. My first time coming to Sundance, I came as the guest of Claire Duvall, my special best friend. Special audience member. <laughs> special audience member. Yes. Um... We were in a movie together called But I'm a Cheerleader and Clea was coming to do press for it and I had a smaller part so I didn't have responsibilities. Um, but I just came and hung out with her and we stayed in a little cabin and had so much fun. And now we're here again because I'm in her movie that she wrote and directed and produced and starred in. I'm so <laughs> proud of her. Imogen, have you been here before? Oh, uh, no, I, I haven't ever been here before, and I've always wanted to come, um, and I've just been really excited, and 
standing at the window looking outside and then thinking, oh, I'll just go outside because that's what I'm looking at. And just <laughs> being surrounded by these mountains is, I mean, it's extraordinary. And the altitude gets better and better. You just start to go with it and live the dreams. <laughs> <laughs> Melanie, even though you were sort of just like a participant, uh, no, sorry, an observer the first year, um, have you noticed big changes sort of in the festival since since that first visit? Yeah, I mean, there were a couple of, because I think I've been here seven times now, and there were a couple of years in the middle that were so crazy, like the Paris Hilton years, you know. Um, Did you see her? Yeah. Like everywhere, and I was like, "What is this? Why are you?" I, s <laughs> I said to someone, "What's her movie? Like, what? What is she in?" And they were like, "No." <laughs> um, but it, it got like very. It was very intense for a time where it was just sort of. There were all these strange parties, and people were like, hey, come see the show at 2 a.m. at such and such. And I was like, I don't want to see movies. Also, we have press in the morning. We have to get some sleep. <laughs> it was just this strange sort of like party environment. And the movies were still great, and the programmers were so amazing, and so many great film discoveries come out of here. But I do feel like this year and the last time I was here, it seems to have settled again more into more of a of filmmaking, people are talking about the movies so much and it's less kind of sceney and it just feels wonderful. So you're saying you didn't hit a swag suite this year? This year. Yeah, I totally did, but <laughs> um, there's, less, there's less of that. There you go. Um, well, let's talk about the movie you're in. Do you want to tell everyone a little bit about um, Clea's film? Um, in Clea's movie, I play an uptight control freak who's a total nightmare. Um, who's avoiding all of her issues by holding an intervention for two friends of hers who are married who she thinks should get divorced. And she ropes a bunch of other people into it and they go to a beautiful house in Savannah and they hold a marriage intervention. It's a comedy. <laughs> it's a great idea. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's called The Intervention. It's and called I The Intervention, yeah. Right. I think we have a clip if we want to oh, roll sure. that. So as we were saying, you two have been friends for a long time. Was, how did it change the dynamic on set, acting and working alongside someone you knew for so long? Well, I was so nervous. The whole thing made me nervous. Clea said, I wrote a movie for you, and I was like, oh, God, what if I don't like it? Um, but it was so funny and so great. Um, and before we started working together, I can be quite feisty at work just because... I don't have any training or anything like that, so the only thing I go on is my instinct, and I protect it very carefully. So if somebody says, hey, can you um, pick up this jug and walk over here, and then you know, say it kind of like this, I get really like, because I know doing something against my instincts, I feel like a robot, and I look like a robot. And so I just was worried, like, what if Clea and I have a difference in how something should go? You know, I don't want to get into a fight with her. I don't want it to be uncomfortable. So I went to therapy. <laughs> and I talked to my <laughs> therapist about it and sort of, like, came up with, like, a, a way to still <laughs> stay in myself because I'm so terrified. She's my favorite person in the world, and I'm so scared of, you know, fighting with her <laughs> conflicts. Um, so, and it... Actually, like, of course, then I got there and I was like, oh, we're best friends and I've read every draft of the script and we have the exact same sensibility. So there, there wasn't any, you know, clashes like that. The anxiety was unwarranted. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we didn't get to see this part of the film, but uh, as it turns out, the intervention sort of ends up being flipped onto your character because 
you have a drinking problem in the, but, but it's played comically in the movie. Talk about yeah. pl playing drunk, was that a challenge? It's, it's kind of one of my favorite things, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's just so funny. Drunk people are so funny to me. I can't even have one sip of alcohol and play drunk. I have to be completely sober. Um, but I don't know, I think I always sort of like pretend do that just for fun, and Cleo was like, I love that, I think that's funny, I'm gonna put it in the movie. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, I don't know, it's fun, it's so weird. No actual alcohol, you didn't take No any actual answer. alcohol, nice. no. And Imogen, let's talk, I know you have two films, but uh, I'd love to talk about Frank and Lola. Can you tell us a little bit about what it's about? Yeah, uh, Frank and Lola is essentially a love story set in Las Vegas, um, and uh, it's about a couple who fall madly in love, um, and ultimately, um, destroy each other through that. I mean, I, I, I suppose there are sound bites which you're supposed to describe it um, with, but I really think of it as kind of a love and sanity incompatible, and that's sort of the, they probably are, and that's sort of what the film explores, um, in in my opinion, and um, and that love really is a form of madness, um, and all of us as human beings can relate to that, not just romantically, but um, as parents or siblings or someone's daughter or son, you, you understand um, the lengths you go to and how you start to just lose your mind. Um, so it's a thriller of sorts. Yeah. Headed for an intervention, maybe. They, What's that? They never got to head to the intervention point, but they could be headed there. The, yeah, yeah, maybe. Yeah. maybe. <laughs> Should we see Imogen's clip now? Yeah. Is your work any good? Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I just had my show, my thesis show. Oh, for real? All right, well, yeah, well, I'll set up a studio visit. You're not going to do No. I don't care about that stuff, no. Why are you offering me this? I don't know, maybe because you're being mean to me, and I like it. Oh. I like a little sass. Oh. And it's not an offer, okay? It's just, a, just an interview. And uh, I should make it clear that I don't sleep with anyone who works for me. I learned that lesson the hard mm -hmm. way. There you go. Keith Winkleman. That's right. Hi, sweetie. You with Patricia? No, she's still up in her room. I've been here for over an hour. Are you close by? Yeah, turn to your left. Hello, handsome man. Who is the mook? The mook? Yeah, that tool that was trying to fuck you. Come on, he was harmless. Uh, I guess it's fine. Are you okay? Well, they closed the deal. So, you know, new owners, new chef, new everything. It's done. I'm sorry. Yeah. You knew it was coming. I'll be fine. Yeah, of course you will. Gonna miss our reservation. I'm gonna try shaming her out of her room. Hey. Look beautiful. So, as we get a sense of there, you and Michael Shannon are really like toe to toe the entire time. Um, and I know a lot of times you guys don't get to. Uh, rehearse with your co-stars beforehand, but I, in this situation, it seems like it would have been essential to get to know one another. Yeah, and we'd, we'd met a couple times before in various places, um, and we didn't have that long to rehearse or anything like that, but we were in Las Vegas, and we were there for a long time. Um, we were there for kind of three weeks or so, and normally you want to go there for, what, 24 hours and then <laughs> leave and forget or remember it. But um, we were there for three weeks, and um, there's like one bar, everyone used to hang out there, a lot of the time, and you really just get to know each other obviously quite rapidly and intimately on a film, um, on any project. Um, you're living in each other's pockets. But um, Connect Four was a game that was around Las Vegas a lot. That's a great, that's a great bonding game that <laughs> happened, yeah. Was there gambling involved? There wasn't, and no, it was very, no, very innocent. There was no gambling. I didn't gamble, probably should have done that, but I didn't. 
get around to it. So both of you guys are big chameleons. You are obviously an independent film and um, about to be in two new cable shows. You're on Roadies and you're on Togetherness. Yeah. Um, so tell me about sort of how you are, obviously increasingly actors are dipping their toes into all these different um, mediums. Uh, have you always thought that that was the way your career would take shape or has it um, been a surprise to engage in TV and film? Well, I suppose now, I mean, if you've ever had any sort of stigma about any um, medium specifically, that does start to just disintegrate because you can see now terrific filmmakers and actors working in all sorts of mediums. And um, it's really just for me about well, the director and, and the role. And it's quite extraordinary how television does provide uh, you with an opportunity to have a really fully fleshed out role um, and layered and... Um, kind of endlessly fascinating, because um, there's a lot of time. So that, to me, um, it's, it's very new, it's a very new experience, but I um, just adore the filmmaker and, and the rest of the cast, and I'm really excited to, to do it. And you were on Two and a Half Men before you were on Togetherness, yes? Yes. Yes. <laughs> no Charlie Sheen questions. Um, OK. Uh, but with, I would assume um, you have a little bit more of a leisurely pace on, on the HBO show. Oh, no. No? I, well, I was only a regular on Two and a Half Men for two years. Um, I get very panicky when I'm sort of tied into something, and I, it got to a point where I was like, oh, this show became massively popular, and I was like, I'm going to be the wacky neighbour on a sitcom, and that's it for the rest of my life. So I changed my contract so I was able to come and go. So for the next... I think 11 years that that show was on. I was doing movies and doing other things and I would come if I had time free or, you know, so it was very relaxed for me. So they would call and say, can you do two episodes? And I was so grateful for it financially. It was just wonderful to have this sort of consistent thing so I could do little independent movies and try to build that career. Um, but doing a sitcom is the easiest job of all time being an actor on a sitcom, the hours are so easy. So it would just be like a little vacation and I would have a trailer. I was like, oh my God, trailers, oh. <laughs> um, and two and a half, um, togetherness is so different because it, it's, uh, you know, it's like 12 hour days and a lot more is packed into it. And emotionally, there's a, a lot of stuff to do. It's my favorite job I've ever had. I'm just, I feel so lucky to be a part of it show. I, I saw um, you mentioned trailers uh, and uh, you've been in big studio films like Need for Speed and but you've also yeah. done a lot of indie films. Are those uh, like sort of the cliche differences uh, people meant think of uh, you know craft services and trailers like what are the big differences between working on a low budget film versus like this big car chase movie? Well it's interesting I think my, I mean my personal experience has been obviously the same work ethic has always uh, applied from different um, all the all the kind of faculties within like the making of the film, um, but I've certainly found that there is a, a real beauty to the liberal nature of independent filmmaking, especially experiencing that as a woman. Um, there are just not as many constraints. So you're not having to conform necessarily to a uh, specific formula, and I think um, it's that's something that I just realised. It really does set you free in that way. But yeah, obviously there are kind of better snacks um, <laughs> when there's race cars involved, I suppose. But, yeah. I also like, because I've done so many independent films, I'm really used to working quickly. And I really like it. Like I like um, getting through a scene quickly and not having a lot of time to you know, be waiting in between and it keeps the energy up. And that's the hardest thing for me when I go onto a bigger project is just how long it can take to do a scene and just trying to keep my emotional energy at a particular place. We'll get to audience questions in a sec, but um, I wanted to ask you, Melanie, I've seen you tweeting a lot during the festival and in general, you're a big social media person, Imogen, less so. What are your feelings on the Twitter sphere? Well, um, well I'm, yes, I'm a bit of a dinosaur when it comes to social media. Um, but, you know, I, I used to actually be quite hostile towards the idea of it because I 
fell victim to that notion of, well, it's just narcissism and it's just kind of self-promotion and this uh, platform which seems completely irresponsible. But then you start to look at it and it's an extraordinary um, foundation for, especially for like filmmakers and musicians and artists. Um, so it, I think it can work in many different ways. Um, obviously there are disappointing aspects to it as well because I do feel like a lot of the art of conversation has declined in, in, in some sense and it's become more about the sound bite and something digestible and quick. Um, but, um, but yeah, so there are pros and cons, but I, I, don't, I don't think I'm really cut out for it yet. Gotta get some tips from Melanie over here. Right. Yeah. yeah. You, you engage a lot with other um, filmmakers and actors and stuff, right? I do, I love Twitter for that. And I love, um, I mean, I'm such a dork, as you know, for film writers and critics. And I, I love reading criticism. I love reading people's writing on movies and, so I've, you know, I follow all these people, and you and I are Twitter friends, and Twitter BFFs. Yeah, Twitter BFFs. <laughs> um, and I, re I like it. And then you meet people in real life, and it's, it's just, it's been a really wonderful tool for me to, to meet people who I admire. And also, I mean, I don't have that many followers, so it's not that big a deal if I tweet about something. But it is nice to have like somewhat of a platform. If you have a friend or, you know, you see a tiny movie that you really like to be able to talk about it and, and you know, you, you see it get retweeted and you know the words getting out about something that is important or special to you and that's nice. Or just to live tweet The Bachelor, which I've totally. definitely seen you do. Yeah, yeah. for sure. <laughs> <laughs> bachelor is, you know, it's very important. It is. <laughs> it's, the, it's the most important thing. All right, let's let you guys in on the conversation. Right here. Uh, I think they're coming over with the mic. Oh, okay. Thank you. Uh, I'm a, been a patron and supporter of Sundance Institute for the last 10 years. I've been coming here for about the past 10 years. It's a pleasure to meet you and be around you. Um, uh, my daughter is actually would like to pursue a career similar to yours. She's uh, 17 now, going to college next year. Any tips or messages that I can give to her? Any two ideas that you think you can share with me that I can pass on to her? So just checking before I answer this. It's tips about how to... How to follow your steps. Ah, I see. Um, well, I suppose um, as an actor, you obviously have to... I, I found personally that um, you just become uh, stronger and um, you hope to become stronger. And there is some resilience, but there's also a real uh, dedication and commitment to wanting to do this and um, a real love for it and whatever road you take um just i suppose just try and um keep going i mean it's it's such a weird weird industry and um and it can be a struggle at times but i, I think it's really just about knowing what you want to do and and staying focused on that and not falling victim to what other people might like to see you doing um and and really um working hard and um, kind of expanding and exploring what your taste is and everything like that. Because you, you're only here on the earth once, potentially. So um, you want to, yeah, keep, keep going, if that helps. <laughs> um, that's such good advice. I, I guess I would say for me the most important thing, kind of a turning point in my career was when I stopped trying to be something other than what I was. You know, I moved to Los Angeles and it was in the late 90s and just everyone was tiny and beautiful and had the Rachel and, you know, everyone was like so skinny and I just was like, oh God, I have that's what I have to do. And I got quite obsessive and I wasn't well and I wasn't taking care of myself and I also wasn't getting work because I was, you know, a kind of sadder version of that thing. And then I sort of had a, you know, just like this, people were like, oh, dear. <laughs> and then I just kind of had a realization where I was like, the only thing I have to offer is myself and the things that make me unique and the person that I am. And maybe I can have some faith in the fact that there might be filmmakers who are looking for something that isn't exactly that thing. And then I st my whole life changed once I sort of came to terms with it 
and started eating bread again. <laughs> and I, I was happier and I was more fulfilled and I had something to bring and I, you know, and I just, that, that's all you have. And individuality is such a beautiful and wonderful thing. And I, it's my favorite thing and all my favorite actors, you know, Isabel Huppier and the, God, this list of women that I could give, but I, I like to see someone's face moving. I like someone who looks like they've eaten pasta at a restaurant. Like I like people who look like real people and, so that, I don't know, just tell her to not feel like she has to try to make herself into something that's not comfortable for her to fit into. I love that answer. And you, do, you both of you seem really comfortable in yourselves, and I'm sure that's not easy when you're getting requests to change your hair color or whatever. I mean, how do you, when, when someone comes up to you and says, are you willing to look this way or do this thing for this part? How do you stay true to yourself? Well, I think that's such a valuable thing you were just saying about um, people when you see their face move. I mean, there's, there's, nothing, there's the reason why um, it's extraordinary to watch an actor like Willem Dafoe on screen or uh, Christopher Walken or pe people who really... Um, your face shows your experience, and that's what we want to see. That's what helps us understand um, something relevant to our own existence here. And, and, and I just think vanity has to, at some point, just take a walk, because it's not about that. Um, but I, but I, really do, uh, I really do think, in terms of feeling comfortable in your own skin, something does start to happen where you start to relax and to okay, I finally understand now th the type of work I would really love to do. And, um, and you learn that perhaps from doing things which you've been really miserable on or you have not, um, you've not followed your intuition and um, kind of betrayed that. So it's, so it's really um, finding that and um, definitely it takes a second, I think. Yeah, and I mean, it's definitely a struggle. I mean, my poor boyfriend has to hear like the litany of complaints that I have about my body and you know <laughs> everything else every everyone especially women has a stupid standard that they it's just internalized so much that it's impossible to let go of so there's still a part of me that's processing that every day and just being like oh god oh god but I try to sort of remember the bigger picture and I think like how would I feel if I saw a woman who looked like myself in a movie I'd I'd be like, oh my God, great, that's me, I see myself up there. And there are women who've said things like that to me, that they see themselves in some way, they feel represented, and that's so much more important to me than, you know, being able to wear a sample size or whatever. It's really depressing to not be able to wear a sample size, because <laughs> then you'd have to buy your own clothes. But, <laughs> but apart from that, you know, there's like a bigger thing that I just try to keep in mind when I'm like freaking out. And it's funny too, because some, I found sometimes, um, in, until you actually meet someone face to face, say a director or someone like that, if they just like find a picture of you and you're wearing some ball gown and you're like, yeah. I don't know why I was wearing that. And like you have some crazy hairdo and, and they see an image and they think that's you. And then you sort of have to be like, no, I'm not actually a poodle. That's, that was just <laughs> Tuesday. But uh, so it's kind of interesting how you, it, yeah, it's sort of, yeah. there's a version which is the poodle side and then there's the human side. I was auditioning for a studio movie a couple of years ago and I, I went in one time and they said, she really needs to step it up with the hair and makeup. And I was like, I don't know what that means. You know, I kind of did my best. And they sent a picture of me from the Emmys. And they were like, something like this. You're like, I, I need a glam to Like, <laughs> call them the Kardashians like, person. But it literally was what you're talking about, yeah. where I had this weird snake thing. Like, I just was like, what do you... Also, I'm playing, like, some guy's wife or something like that. Like, why would you have... It's a bunch of morons. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Sass, yes. <laughs> All right, who else has a question? Well, we got a lot. Right here? Yeah, go ahead with the scarf. Um, so, yeah, sort of to just touch on that, um, I've followed your work since Heavenly Creatures, and honestly, as a little girl growing up trying to be an actress, I always thought I had to be the cookie-cutter look and change my nose or do this, and 
finally, I, it wasn't until I embraced the fact that I'm more of a character actress that I started actually getting parts in theater and stuff in school because I had more confidence of that and I started to enjoy those roles. And I noticed for you, especially like you've done a lot of small roles but there are roles that are so memorable and that I've loved and that have meant a lot to me personally. And so I guess one of the things I've always wanted to know is um, do you appreciate the fact that you get to do those small roles that have those personalities that are so particular? And I guess, how do you approach that um, as an actress? And for me personally, um, I've done a lot more theater than I've done film. Is it a big step to switch between one or the other? And I guess, how would one start that process? Gosh. Um, well, I only ever really did theater when I was at high school. And then I didn't um, have acting training, so I feel like a bit of a fraud. You know, there's so many great... One of my best friends in the world um, is this actress, Nina Arianda. I don't She's know. Amazing. I know, I know, She's right? Amazing. I'm just like, I'm such a fan of hers. Um, and there are people like that who've trained and studied and have the voice and have the physicality, and I just kind of feel like, who am I to think I with my little mouse voice that I could go and... Um, but maybe one day. Um, so I don't really have a lot of advice about that. But in terms of choosing things, I did a movie a few years ago with an actor named Matt Damon. He's very talented. <laughs> um, I'm sure you'll see him someday. He'll, you know. Um, but he's, he, he has such a great career, you know, and I just so respect the work that he's done. And so I was trying to get all the advice I could from him, and he said, you know, people just look at your filmography and they just see the titles of the movies and the thing that they think about is, oh, that was a good movie, that was a good movie. He's like, they don't remember that you played some, like, crazy heroin addict or something and you regret, you know, they don't remember, like, oh, that was an interesting director. So he said, you can only really go by the script and if the script is great, then the movie could be great. And... I just always thought about that, like what a wonderful thing it would be to just have a list of movies that you felt really good about. And so it hasn't mattered to me if I'm in two scenes of the movie or a lot of the movie. If I feel like it's a really wonderful project, then I want to be part of it. Are there parts that you guys wish um, s still want to have that you haven't been offered yet or don't get in the room for? Like what would be your dream situation? Sometimes it, it's, it's a funny question, isn't it? Because sometimes you don't know until you see it, yeah. if that makes sense. Um, mm -hmm. But certainly, uh, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, a hard, it's a hard thing to say. You can only think about what you have already seen sort of on the screen or on stage. Um, but, um, I mean, you look at an actor like John Cazale or something, and, and he, what was those four films he did, and each of them such different characters, and... Just, yeah, an, an extraordinary, and just, I mean, that's, <laughs> I just want to be like John Cazale, but he's, um, something like that, I mean, it's just fascinating roles, integral to a story, um, but you, and they, they have the ability to stay with you for such a long time, but yeah, as an actor, I, d I don't know, I guess it's just when you, when you see it. You're not like, I want to be a superhero. Um... <laughs> It'd be quite, I also would be quite interesting to sort of play a superhero with allergies or something. Because yes, what a if, flawed superhero. You know, exactly, or like if Cinderella suddenly, I don't know, was allergic to, to mice, that would be a real dilemma. So <laughs> things like that would be sort of interesting. Yeah. I know you were waiting right there. Hi, I'm Sean. I'm um, an actor who also grew up a plain chubby girl, so. I appreciated your answer. Um, my question for both of you, specifically in Green Room and in Intervention, how do you, um, as actors, hit the comedic moment so effortlessly, and how much of it is your instinct, and how much do you rely on your director to make it so believable, the comedic moments in, in both those films? Well, so sometimes it's interesting, isn't it, when you see something you've done and, and you didn't necessarily know that it was going to be funny in the moment. Um, so a lot of that is down to terrific editing, which I'm sure can go either way. So with something like Green Room, when I saw it, um, I was astounded. I mean, I do think Jeremy Saulnier is 
one of the most talented directors ever and also that I've been lucky to work with um, and it was far more kind of comedic than we realised at the time which is very smart I think um, because the funniest things often are actually stemming from quite a melancholy place or terrifying place um, but it's also uh, down to the people around you I think and, and who you're opposite and in that film with Anton and Alia and Callum and Joe and Eric and everyone it was um it was just, it's, it's kind of ridiculous because it's just, it's just a bunch of human beings not knowing what the hell is going on, which is so, so, it's just so, so funny. But I think, I think a lot of it has to do with the editing, but I, I, don't, I don't necessarily know. Yeah, I think d definitely. And also, yeah, <laughs> editing. <laughs> Sometimes I've done some things where they've taken the the air out of it, you know? And there are pauses that are kind of essential to the comedy of it, and you just see it sort of like shoved together and you're like, no. Mm -hmm. um, but I think a really important thing as far as directors go for comedy, your director needs to be able to let you kind of do your own thing. The worst thing for comedy that I've found is when someone's sort of micromanaging and hyper-controlling and everyone's just sort of feeling constrained and scared to make a weird choice because sometimes the funniest things are the things that just sort of fly out of your mouth or, you know, you decide to do one weird thing. And um, so I felt really lucky in our movie that Clea let us just kind of breathe and do our own thing and, yeah. Right there. Um, Imogen, my uh, friends and myself were fortunate enough to see Green Room a couple nights ago. Oh, cool. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> part of my passion, it was seriously, you were seriously fucking incredible. Oh, thank you very seriously. much. Seriously, we thank haven't you. stopped talking about it. Oh, that's so yeah. nice. Thank you. Uh, no, th thank you. And the cast was just great. I can't say uh, enough good things about it, seriously. But the question I have for you is, we were talking to Jeremy, like listening to him talk during the Q&A and talking to him after the, uh, after the screening. He was talking about how he wanted to get you and your co-stars to keep up the intensity by you guys only had a couple of takes to do things. So I was wondering if you and your co-stars found that it helped or hindered your ability to execute the chemistry and the deliveries that you wanted out of yourselves and each other. Well, yeah, it, I think um, I think what can happen is it stems down from the director. So if Jeremy has created a space which is extremely comfortable and safe and no one feels any sort of um, humiliation or embarrassment about what it takes to help you um, completely disappear into a role and everyone has their own way of doing that. But um, it, was, it was a very intensive shoot also because we literally were using just one room. <laughs> so uh, we were all in there at the same time it smelt terrific, not, but it was very, um, it was very intense and it was claustrophobic. And I think you, we actually ended up wanting to stay in the environment because it helps you um, stay in it. Um, but he, he really is a very, um, he's just a very, very talented guy and he, he knew exactly what he was doing, but he also, talking about micromanaging, he's just, just, just not in his, system whatsoever um, and it just has to do I think with trust in your actors because we've all got to trust in each other and um, and yeah he's a beautiful collaborator but I'm re thank you very much I'm really glad that you liked it. Oh, I, like I said I cannot say enough good about it. Terrific thank you. <laughs> <laughs> do you guys prefer um, having a lot of takes to explore uh, different uh, performances or do you like to just bang it out and kind of think your best things are on your first couple of takes? I don't like to have too many. I mean, I, I will. And sometimes you find something in later takes, but I like the immediacy. I like the kind of surprise of it. Yeah, it's, it's hard to say. I suppose it definitely depends on the nature of the scene and, and the moment and what it might be. Um, and who, again, who you're with in that moment. But um, it, it can be... It certainly... I don't know. I mean, I, I've I've never actually worked with 
a filmmaker who wants to do thousands and thousands of takes. Um, and I'd be intrigued to what that, how that process would be like. You hear about David Fincher working that way and stuff. Um, so it'd be an interesting thing to try. But um, also, you often don't have a, a lot of time, do you, on especially on independent mm. films to get um, lots of different takes. But um, yeah, I think it really depends on, again, the filmmaker, I suppose. Take a couple more. Right back there. And if so, how do you fight that? <coughs> well, I think with any any sort of um, profession like this, you're immediately branded because it makes uh, you kind of uh, easier to understand and um, and use to use the disgusting word that they can sort of sell this concept of what you were meant to be. Um, but it's kind of exciting to to fight against that. And um, and really, you'll all, I mean, you'll always be branded essentially, won't you? Because we're all just separate people, um, bringing different things to um, our work, I, I suppose. But um, I think that'll always, that's probably always happened and will continue to happen, whether it's genre of a film or whether it's a specific type of actor. Um, but it's really, um, it's really, I think you want to keep surprising yourself. That's a pretty exciting um, place to keep trying to get back to yeah I think for me if I read something and it feels if I don't feel excited by it if it feels repetitive to me or I'm starting to think of another character that I've already played while I'm reading it then I don't I don't have enough in my heart to give it so I won't want to do it but sometimes the characters can be from similar walks of life or you know I play a lot of people with young kids or whatever. And I don't think about the, you know, they're kind of, I don't know, I guess that could could be typecasting if you play people who are in similar situations or whatever. But for me, if there's like a different emotional path in the story, then I'm gonna be excited and want to do it. As a type of role, either one of you would want to play a totally different than to date. Well, the Cinderella with allergies. Okay. That would be good, wouldn't it? Yeah, that would be good. To play something like a lizard or something. It'd be fun. I love you so much. You're so weird. <laughs> so beautiful and so weird. Um, I don't know. It's, it's kind of what Imogen was saying before, that you kind of know it when you see it. Something settles in you and you're like, oh, okay, this thing. Melanie, I know someone mentioned earlier um, Heavenly Creatures, and that was that was sort of your debut onto the film scene. Was can you talk about that experience a little bit? Uh, she mentioned typecasting. Like, was there a lot of expectation for you after that film came out? Oh no, <laughs> no, it was very quiet. Um, I I think you know I was sort of taken from high school and put in this movie when I was fifteen, and I played this kind of awkward. Um, a strange person and it was a very dark movie and um, I think everyone was just kind of like well they found a kid at high school and that's I mean it was so different from my own personality but nobody knew that you know so and I just went back to high school and finished high school and nobody was like n knocking my door down and also I was in the movie with Kate Winslet who you know is amazing and she had been a professional actor at that point for six years and she had headshots and she was very glamorous and she was like, this is it, this is my first film and now I'm gonna, you know, and I was like, oh, that's what it, it looks like to be a professional actor and I sort of felt like I had no business, I, there wasn't a part of me that was like, me too. I was just sort of like, I'm lucky to be here. <laughs> and I had to wait, I wasn't proactive about it, I had no confidence and, you know, finally an agent called me this, sweet lady called me up and said she wanted to be my agent and I worked with her until she died, literally. She passed away two years ago. Um, and I, 
yeah, it, it took a long time. It took a long time for me to build my confidence up and and feel like I had something to offer and be able to go into the room and be like, this is actually who I am and not just sit there, you know, and be sort of like, what am I doing here? It's crazy that you were 15. When you went to back to high school, is everyone like, Wah-ha! this is so cool? No. They were like, <laughs> you're weird. You did a movie where you kissed a girl. <laughs> I was like, hmm, okay. One or two more. Sorry, in the way, way back. Uh, Melanie, you mentioned um, you had to reach a point to where you had to kind of embrace your own individuality. Um, I was wondering maybe for the both of you, uh, once you kind of had that realization, do you feel like more opportunities came to you organically that were more artistically fulfilling? Absolutely. Um, yes. And um, yeah, I think there was, um, I think that moment ha- happened a few years ago and, and I certainly realized the type of work that I really, really wanted to be doing, and perhaps that was from doing things which were not fulfilling. But again, as you mentioned just then about the idea of feeling lucky to be there, lucky to be at work, to be a working actor, full stop, to be an auditioning actor, a working actor, all these things, Um, and then to sort of say to yourself, okay, well, I think this is is working out. I want to maybe try and just do stuff that I'm going to find really fulfilling, and, um, and you have to be uh, very decisive about that and, and make ask some important questions to yourself and, and then make some choices. Yeah, I think definitely that's part of it. Having the confidence and the belief in yourself to say no to things that are not exactly what you would want to be doing. I think for a long time I just sort of felt like, oh my God, someone's asking me to do this job. I can't, you know, I'm not... I don't think I'm so fancy that I can say no to a movie. But sometimes there are things that are not going to be fulfilling to you, and it took a long time for me to feel okay about making the right choices for myself. And you know, once you start saying no to stuff, it's very empowering. It is. I remember very clearly this moment, and I was speaking to a director, and I was asking him, um, we were talking about a potential role, and I was asking him questions about it, and... Um, trying to kind of start up a conversation and he went well you know I mean she's just basically um she's just got to be like hot she's just got to be hot you know and I was like yeah all right see ya sayonara and so that's it was sort of like a a big moment um which needed to happen I mean because that's that's a very unfortunate side of this industry is it I know uh the last few months you know there's been a lot of talks about the changing um, landscape in Hollywood between Oscar So White and Jennifer Lawrence's essay um, and Lenny talking about the, the pay gap. Uh, and the big thing that Jennifer talked about was feeling empowered uh, to speak up for herself like you guys are speaking about. Uh, has it become easier for you to do that over time um, when it comes to discussions about um, your salary or just the kind of things you will or will not do within a part or acting like the hot girl or whatever? Well, I think, first of all, it's just so admirable that these women are speaking out, and I think Jennifer Lawrence is so smart um, and beautifully eloquent, and the position that she's in to to be able to express such groundbreaking opinions is is just really awesome. And and it definitely paves a way for other people to do the same. Um, And I think what I found so refreshing, also coming from someone like Lena Dunham, is this idea of your philosophy and... Whether whatever um, in whatever way it falls under the term feminism, whatever that means to you is important and essential. And there's this great book by Roxanne Gay called um, "Bad Feminist," and it's all about how, so yeah, it's terrific. And it's it's a, your values. Your values are where you start, and don't be intimidated by um, what how perfect they should be. But it's really about how far we have to go as women in film, and it's so exciting. And I really, really think. You can feel it. It's just very progressive, and it's um, it, you really do feel s- supported. It's it's quite extraordinary. I've certainly found that. Yeah, I mean, I think for me personally, I don't have like salary conversations. The conversation is more like it's scale, and I'm like, okay, <laughs> and that's the yeah. full. <laughs> that's the only conversation, but. But certainly someone like Jennifer Lawrence, who's a part of these huge machines that are making so much money, 
she's the reason people are going to see those movies and she should be making... Come on. You're, Jennifer Lawrence is in your movie and you're not paying her more than anyone else in the movie. It's insane. She's the biggest movie star in the world. So she should be able to say, I think I deserve to make the amount of money that should be given to me based on the fact that people are coming to see this movie for me without being shamed for it. I mean, people don't say anything to men when they have those kinds of conversations. It's just it's just normal. It's part of, you know, making a deal. And it's just such, such a weird concept to me that it's, like, not okay for women to say this stuff. And I, I love the fact that these conversations are happening. I think it's so important that the Oscars So White thing is happening. It's so important. There are some performances. Jason Mitchell, who, yeah... Thank you. He played Easy E in Straight Outta Compton. I did not see a better performance this year. It was my favorite performance of the year. That kid did ev everything. And I just, it's like astonishing to me. It just kind of got passed over. And this weird conversation that happens whenever an African-American film is successful, like Best Man Holiday or Straight Outta Compton or Ride, you know, Ride Along or any number of movies. And people are like, whoa, surprise box office. And it's like... At this point, you can't keep saying that. Yeah. There, it's crazy. There's like, thank you. Someone's getting an Academy invite uh, a oh, couple weeks from now. I'm like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I mean, there's an audience for those movies. There's an audience for movies about women. And I just, it really bugs me that there are a bunch of men in charge of making those decisions. The filmmakers they choose to uplift are young white guys who remind them of themselves or whatever. Like, it just needs to change. The positions in power need to change. I just, it's, it's making me crazy. Yeah. Yes, girl. <laughs> Let's take one final question. Right there with the beard. <laughs> I think what you're speaking about is extremely important. Uh, we've seen it in queer cinema, we've seen it in black cinema, we've seen it in women filmmakers, and what it comes down to is collaborations and collaborators. What it comes down to is basically looking at the heads of departments, looking at your production designers, and choosing when to upgrade your art director to production designer. I see a lot of people of color on set and a lot of women on set, but I don't see them in the leadership positions. We are not giving them the first chance to be a director. We're not giving them the chances. And what it looks like isn't some uplift from above. What it looks like is collaborating with each other on these small indie levels as our $2,000, $300 short film filmmakers like me. What it looks like is basically, basically just having everybody in because there is no lift from above, there is no, you know, like somebody's gonna help you out. There's people working with the people that they know. And the people that, that have the power right now that they know, they're older white men. So the only way that we're gonna change things is by growing together, by collaborating together, and by saying together, like, I'm going to work with women. I'm gonna work with a woman do, do you have a question? We're getting. <laughs> but well said. No, but well, I love yeah, it. Yeah, it's so yes. yeah, it's, it's so yeah, exactly but everything you're saying. Yes. I guess my question is. <laughs> I guess my question is. Uh, well, perhaps it's where do we start, isn't it? That's sort of. What Thank you, Emma. Well. <laughs> in, I, I believe where we start is, <laughs> it, it, if I can, like just shooting the elephant in the room, like recognizing that, like when, uh, just like that scene that we saw on the screen where the guy is meeting the girl and giving him, uh, her, giving you that leg up on things, that that is the problem of women filmmakers uh, in Los Angeles, and that's what we're not talking about. That's the problem of. Uh, you know, black filmmakers, and, and yeah. <laughs> okay, there we go. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you guys for joining us today. Thank you guys for asking good questions. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. You're, You're the best.